Good evening. Uh, I'm Stefanos Polizoides. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight um, during our first uh, lecture of the spring semester of 21, uh, of 2021, academic year 2021. I have the great pleasure of welcoming Dan and Karen Parolek uh, to the school. They're graduates of the of the of our of our school, and they have um, put together in the last 20 years uh, one of the great uh, architecture and urban design practices in the United States, based in Berkeley. Uh, Professor Philip Bess is going to be introducing them, but I want to tell you, Dan and Carol, Karen, that we're completely thrilled to have you here with us today. Thank you. Philip. Um, thank you, Stephanos, um, and good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome to our first public school of architecture lecture of the spring semester, uh, and welcome Dan and Karen. Um, Dan and Karen Parolik are 1995 graduates of the Notre Dame School of Architecture and two of the most consequential alumni of their generation, co-founders of their Berkeley-based 20-person office known as Opticos. Dan is the chief executive officer and Karen, the chief financial officer of this increasingly influential firm committed to making walkable places for healthy, resilient, and equitable communities. On behalf of such good places, Opticos is among an elite group of national firms successfully promoting the adoption of form-based codes, which are needed to replace our current two-generation regime of segregated use-based codes that have resulted in suburban sprawl and so-called urban renewal. They are co-authors of the book, Form-Based Codes, a guide for planners, urban designers, municipalities, and developers, and have become leaders in rethinking how to better regulate land development toward the end of more walkable, sustainable places in which human beings can flourish. Dan is also the author of the recently published and highly acclaimed book, Missing Middle Housing, Thinking Big and Building Small to Respond to Today's Housing Crisis, which has as its primary objective the reclamation of a range of low-rise, high-density urban housing types, ubiquitous in pre-1950s American towns and city neighborhoods, but almost completely lost over the past 70 years. It is not too much to say that their work in zoning and code reform and in the recovery of historic, durable, and handsome middle housing types that for too long have gone missing is an exemplary model of engaging a critical task in the restoration of beautiful, walkable, mixed use urbanism. Dan and Karen recognized early the truth that if you commit yourself to good traditions of architecture and urbanism, there is much prerequisite spade work to be done and they are doing it. Happily, this is now setting Dan and Karen up for the very interesting variety of architectural and urban design projects now coming out of Opticos. Um, aided and abetted, I'm happy to say, by numerous Notre Dame graduates of both our undergraduate and graduate programs, who in turn have benefited from Karen's diligent attention in her role as CFO in making Opticos a founding B corporation, a certified impact-driven company committed to a triple bottom line of social, environmental, and phys fiscal responsibility. It seems to me like a win-win-win situation for all concerned. Uh, and I'm delighted that Karen and Dan can be with us today via Zoom to tell us more about their work. Um, Dan and Karen Parola. Oh my goodness, Phil, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was an incredibly thoughtful and generous um, welcome. So thank you. And uh, thank you, Dean Polyzoides and Mary Beth and uh, faculty and staff and students at Notre Dame. We're thrilled to be here. And um, you know, it's been 25 years since we graduated from Notre Dame and uh, the excellent program there at the School of Architecture, which certainly set us all on our path. 
So, um, and as we get started, I want to mention one other uh, person, which is Stefan Pellegrini, another Notre Dame grad, uh, class of 96. Uh, Stefan was the first person to join Dan and me at Opticos over 18 years ago, and he's been our third partner at Opticos for the past 12 years. Um, and it's really a trio that we're presenting for today. So along with the over 50 other Opticos alumni and team members over the years. So I want to shout out to all of them and a huge thank you to Stefan for being our partner. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay. So. I wanna start with this uh, diagram by Deepa Iyer on the roles of social change. I posted this on our office Slack channel a few months ago as the call for racial justice was rising to consider our role in needed change. Uh, clearly as architects and urbanists, we are builders and visionaries, uh, but Stefan's response was that we are also weavers, weaving together people's stories, their challenges, their needs and their hopes into a design that we co-create with them. This diagram also helped me understand more about my own path to becoming a leader of an impact-driven organization. Because 30 years ago, when I was studying at Notre Dame, I knew by my sophomore year that I wasn't going to be an architect. I wasn't quite sure where I was headed, but I did realize the value and strength of the architecture education I was receiving and the importance of creative problem solving and design thinking. So I continued and finished my architecture degree. And I also completed a second major in graphic design as a way to explore further. So let's talk about design thinking. Albert Einstein once said, if he had an hour to solve a problem, he would spend 55 minutes understanding the problem and five minutes solving it. So this is one way we can think about it. We endeavor to understand the problem and then to bring our knowledge of past solutions along with our own innovations to solve the problem. And then we iterate as needed. But there's a third piece of the puzzle that has been critical to our ability at Opticos to have impact, which is communication. So first, we communicate with various stakeholders to understand the problem. Community members, local politicians, business leaders, developers, asking lots of questions and digging to make sure we understand and get to the root of their stories. It is a real and important skill to be able to listen and ask questions to get to the root of a problem. And when our projects fail or community members are upset with the results, it's often because we didn't do enough digging. We took their concerns at surface level with an, oh, got, got it, kind of response, rather than truly hearing them and responding with, tell me more. To get it right, we must work with them to make sure we truly understand. Then when we get to the solving part of the process, communication is just as critical in two other ways. First, how do we communicate our ideas back into the conversation? Do we connect our proposals to the community's needs and interests? Do we convey it in a way that's understandable and approachable? And second, are we communicating in a fluid back and forth so that we are in fact co-creating the solutions with everyone involved and affected? Now, we'll be the first to admit that we're not always successful at this, but it is what we strive for. So at Opticos, we've spent much as much time on understanding and communicating as on the actual solutions and innovations. Yet the solutions and innovations are what people see. It's what gets us invited to speak about form-based coding, about miss missing middle housing. But the reality is that it's our focus on all three, understanding, solving, and communicating that's been the root of our success. So I wanna share an example. This is Isla Vista, California, a small town that we worked in almost 20 years ago. They invited us to help them create a plan and a zoning code for their small town. And one of the key issues that they identified was that their main street was struggling and they wanted to figure out how to make it thrive. So we did our typical urban designer thing, some analyses and some studies, and then we shared with them our results. They needed more housing within walking distance of the main street. Okay, they said, but no more than 16 dwelling units per acre. Now that answer took us off guard. It's pretty common to hear people talk about, complain about actually density, but very unusual for them to have a specific technical number. Now we could have just said, well, that's not gonna work. You need more density than that. But instead we got curious, what's behind that number? We needed to find out more. So Dan said, let's go out and look around, see what we can understand. So we took them on a walking tour with the community members, the first of many, many walking tours over the years. 
And as we were walking, we came upon this building and everyone loved it. They loved the building, the courtyard, the greenery, everything. We thought this could be the answer. So we noted it and moved on. And afterward, Dan went back, snuck around to count the electric boxes, paced off the size of the lot, did some quick calculations to see what the density was. And we reported back to the community, this building that you love, is 42 dwelling units to the acre. It was almost triple the density that they had said was their max. And this was a big aha moment for us. We realized how people's perceptions of density were different from the possibilities. What they thought of as 16 dwelling units per acre was, was four plus story mid rises. And in reality, we were able to show historical solutions in their own town to show that form and scale were the issue, not density. We paired historical solutions with understanding the issues and innovative communication. This solidified for us the importance of both listening and communicating thoughtfully. Dan calls that story the beginning of the missing middle housing movement. So how do we understand the problem? Who do we listen to? Whose problems are we trying to solve? Sasha Costanza Chalk, the author of the book, Design Justice, talks about inclusion in design. She asks one, who was involved in the process? Two, who benefits from the design solution? And three, who is harmed by the solution? And typically, the most benefits go to the more powerful and the most harms go to the less powerful. So what can we do to change that? As urbanists, we see the benefits of walkable urbanism. Diverse housing sizes and choices support economic diversity, housing affordability, and housing stability. Housing in walkable neighborhoods support sustainable and healthy transportation choices. Safe and vibrant public spaces provide places for us to gather in community. But we must check ourselves. Who was involved in the process or who did we listen to in order to understand the problems in this particular community? And who benefits and who is harmed by our proposed solutions? In some areas, unwanted gentrification has resulted when the focus weighed too much on developing an area and changing it rather than on the possibility of responsibility of serving the community already there. In other areas, focusing too much on the existing community or maybe the loudest voices in that community rather than on the needs of the entire community have prevented the building of needed housing and diverse housing options. So we must listen well. We must understand the power dynamics at play in the communities that we work with in both the community engagement processes that we facilitate and in the solutions that we propose. We must also understand the challenges and experiences of existing residents. Now, some of us may have lived experiences that we can bring to those conversations, while others of us must do the work to build that understanding. So I wanna share a very poignant example of that. Tamir Rice was a 12 year old boy who was shot while playing by himself in a public park. Will his family or those in his community ever see a public park as a safe place for their children to play? How does this view factor into our advocacy for public spaces or of our design for them? So while we can't solve all of society's problems as urban designers and architects, we must truly understand these problems and acknowledge, honor, and lift these realities. While we may deeply believe in the power and importance of public space, we must also acknowledge that there are issues. So I wanna share some of the ways that we've used all three parts of design thinking, understanding, communicating, and solving and innovating in our work. So as Phil mentioned, over our years of work, uh, and we've done a lot of work in zoning, and I can honestly say that our work in zoning reform came out of a need to respond to a problem we heard not from a particular interest in being zoning experts, but over the years, this has been very important work. Part of what's interesting is that the different problems have been raised, but different problems have been raised by different communities. And some of us have been learning a lot more in the last few years about other problems that have existed since the outset. So let's talk about zoning. 20 years ago, as most of you likely know, walkable places were not allowed in the US. In fact, they still aren't, but at the time it was even more rare. Zoning was and is a major barrier. So we and other practitioners were asking, how do we fix zoning to allow walkable communities? That was our question. And ideas started circulating and being tested, particularly by those in the new urbanist community. 
When the basis of our zoning system is separation, homes in one area and businesses in another, it's impossible to build walkable neighborhoods. Something as fundamental as a main street shop with the shopkeeper's apartment on the second story is illegal. So we all looked to historic town patterns here in the US and started to write codes that would allow and even require these types of patterns. Dan had started testing coding as a graduate student, studying the work of a few who had started writing alternative zoning codes and building on that work. He wrote his first zoning code as part of his graduate thesis in 1999. At that point, I was working as a website and software usability designer. So when he wrote his first professional code in 2002, he asked if I could take a look to make it more user-friendly and graphically clean. Starting with that project, we worked together over the years to write better codes to enable more walkable places, as did others in the new urbanist community. Shortly thereafter, Carol Wyant came up with the name, Form-Based Codes. But it turns out change is hard for people. So when we started to propose changing zoning, we had a lot of work to do to build support for that change. Just as it happened in Isla Vista, we asked questions and we listened to their concerns. We then worked to find new ways to address their concerns, sometimes modifying the code, improving it in the process, or sometimes by reframing the problem, like to address the fear of density, or better communicating how the solution worked in a way that would resonate with them and their needs. Every town we worked in was a new opportunity to listen and test these codes against new concerns we heard or test new ways to communicate how the codes worked to address people's concerns. So through this constant process of questioning and adjusting, we came to realize that this new approach to zoning solved other problems our communities are facing. In his 2017 book, The Color of Law, Richard Rothstein summarized ways in which conventional zoning codes and local land use policies contributed to the still existing racial segregation in our communities, including one, long discretionary review processes that lead to both less housing being built and to more expensive housing. Those same discretionary review processes along with unwritten rules administered discriminately through the review process that have a long history of being used to deny approvals to people of color and all of this sitting on the foundation of a conventional zoning system that was explicitly designed to segregate our communities by creating all white suburbs of detached single family homes that people of color were excluded from by various policies and practices from deed restrictions to bank lending practices based on federal redlining maps to outright zoning by color. The zoning map for Atlanta created in 1922 had an R1 white district and an R2 colored district. And while that was deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court two years later, Atlanta officials continued to use the map to guide planning for decades to come. This racial segregation enforced by our zoning has had profound impacts to this day. For example, the reason Richard Rothstein researched and wrote his book was actually in an effort to address persistent school segregation. In addition, segregating black folks into separate areas has created environments that facilitate over-policing and under-protection. And while living in a neighborhood with diverse income levels has been proven to improve the chance of achieving a mid-level income or higher, that hasn't been possible for far too many black, indigenous, and other people of color in the US. These problems of school segregation, police violence, and lack of access to opportunity have all been aided and abetted by our zoning. But it turns out that by creating an alternate zoning system that was intended to foster mixed use, mixed income, diverse and complete communities, we can contribute to solving some of these problems. So form-based coding replaces conventional zoning systems with transparent, streamlined and easy to understand rules, enabling a fairer playing field and preventing discretionary enforcement of unwritten rules. The by right administratively reviewed approval process also makes the approval process quicker and less risky, lowering the cost of building housing. In addition, form-based coding used to create mixed income neighborhoods with missing middle housing helps end the per perpetuation of a racist single family zoning system by allowing a variety of housing choices. So by constantly asking ourselves questions about our designs and solutions, by listening to others, researching the problems they raised and working with them, and by being thoughtful about the way we communicate, we've been able to contribute to much needed zoning reform and help communities provide much needed housing. So let's jump into a few projects. 
Um, I have two that I'm going to share, and then Dan's going. We're going to pass it off to Dan, and he's going to share more. So the first one that I want to share is um, Memphis, Tennessee. In 2017, we were hired by the city and county of Memphis to support them in writing a new general plan. To put the challenges they're facing in perspective, sorry about that. <laughs> to put the challenges they're facing in perspective, the issues Detroit has been facing have received a lot of coverage. So hopefully most of you have a sense of the problems in Detroit. Compared to Detroit, Memphis is four times the land area with only a quarter of the population, almost 16 times the scale of the problem. The city staff in Memphis led by Ashley Cash and John Zena are incredible people, really committed to the community and to finding creative ways to address these issues. It was immediately clear though, that it was the wrong answer for a white led firm from California to fly in from across the country and start driving that process or hosting community meetings. In Memphis, a city with 64% black population and almost 75% black indigenous and other people of color. So we co-created an approach with the staff. The city identified four firms in Memphis with diverse leadership that would be ideal to facilitate the community engagement process. Self and Tucker, BRG 3S, Ray Brown, and the University of Memphis Design Collaborative involving students in the process. Bill Lennertz, founder of the Charette Institute, worked with us to train these groups in the Charette process. Then as a wider team, we all worked together to understand the city and the issues that needed to be addressed. Our Opticos team was led by Stefan Pellegrini, and we brought our specialty in land use and planning to help determine a palette of place types, along with a handbook for the community to use to understand, provide feedback, and apply those place types to their neighborhoods. So Dan will share more about that later, but I wanted to share how we all work together to bring a diverse team together, full of local expertise, along with national expertise, to co-create a plan and a strategy. The team brought in not just local residents, but local community partners and neighborhood organizations in an extensive process of community-based planning that involved over 15,000 residents over the, I think it was a two-year period. In addition, led by Dina Belzer at Strategic Economics, the team determined that the city needed an investment strategy, which is not typically under the purview of a general plan. So the team innovated to develop a system to use the general plan to direct investment. In a city that's so spread out, they can't invest everywhere and they had tough decisions to make. The general plan identifies what are called community anchors and the team was very specific in selecting that language. You'll see at the center of the circle diagram here that community anchors are defined as, they're, sorry, they're not identified particularly as commercial or retail centers. Instead, they're defined as a place where people gather to do things together. So the core tenant of the city's new investment strategy is to focus on places where people gather together. In the end, over 450 community workshops were held and over 150,000 people participated to lead the city council to adopt the plan. It went on to win the National Burnham Award, Daniel Burnham Award from the APA in 2020, but more importantly, in its first year of adoption, 70% of the investment took place in the defined anchors and anchored neighborhoods that the community helped decide on. And lastly, before I hand it over to Dan, um, I wanted to share one of my personal favorite projects. Um, we were invited by the Princess Foundation to work on a growth strategy in Libreville, the capital city of Gabon, on the west coast of Africa. Uh, President Odimbo was leading an effort for Gabon to become the uh, the ecotourism capital of Africa and was very interested in de developing sustainably. Yet he also wanted to provide much needed housing and quickly. Led by the Princess Foundation, the team developed a growth strategy and then Opticus was asked to lead the zoning code. Now, Libreville had never had a zoning code before. Typically, the government would start to lay out a new road and overnight people would stake claims on a spot along the road and start pouring their own concrete bricks to build a home, literally. So having rules and following rules about development was not the way it worked. To have any hope of developing a system that would work and be adhered to, we knew it had to be both simple and helpful. So we created a simple streamlined code that covered the most important basics. Each zone only had one page. 
On the front are a selection of building types, typically two to three, and on the back are examples of what the zone could look like. Once the builder selected a building type, each building type is also only one page. On the front is a short checklist of regulations. We put the checklist right on the page and a palette of frontage types for them to choose from. On the back, again, are examples of what the building could look like. This was all you needed if you were building a, bu a single building. For developers wanting to build more, we designed similarly straightforward and short regulations. And we also included some educational materials on how to create good neighborhoods. And then finally, we also created review lists for the administrators to quickly review applications. And the whole code was designed to easily be transferred into a smartphone app to be both used and administered by smartphone, knowing that code printouts, much less com computers, are in short supply in the area. So as you might imagine, we were thrilled and honored to support President Odimbe and his efforts for sustainable development. And we used it as an opportunity to explore the bare minimum requirements needed to create a good place and to design a unique interface to make it easy for everyone to use, which is right up our alley. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dan to talk about some more of our other projects. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm gonna uh, step back a little bit before I jump into some projects. So just, I just wanted to say that we're extremely fortunate um, in our practice that we can be fairly selective about the projects that we work on. And I'm sure you've noticed from what Karen started to show you that um, this gives us the ability to choose projects that will number one, um, help us deliver a much needed model for a region or a city or, or a developer. Um, number two, help challenge the status quo. Or number three, establish a new best practice standard. And in all this work, um, we utilize our unique understanding of the built environment and I will say, that sort of skill set definitely we uh, established the foundation at our time at Notre Dame's architecture program, as well as our design thinking and the graphic communication that Karen's mentioned to be effective in these projects. Um, the projects I'm going to touch upon range in scale from building um, up to the region. And one of the primary reasons I decided to start Opticos now a little over 20 years ago was I wanted to be able to practice at this broad and diverse range of scales. And an Opticos has enabled me to do that. One of the most impactful ways um, we've used our design thinking was with the creation of the concept of missing middle housing. Um, this concept has greatly influenced the way that cities now around the world are talking about housing choice, zoning reform, and even how state legislation is being created. Um, my home state of Nebraska in 2020 uh, passed a missing middle housing bill and it sort of followed the path of Oregon um, and other states that are also discussing it. And last, just last night, the city of Berkeley, which has been my home now for the past 22 years, uh, the city council voted unanimously to remove single family zoning and replace it with zoning that would enable a broader range of missing middle housing choices in order to deliver more attainable housing throughout our city where as prices have continued to escalate and be out of reach for, for many households. Um, even You can even go to Instagram and one of the great things that is happening is we're seeing local missing middle communities pop up even on Instagram. And one example is Missing Middle Dallas that I was looking at just a few days ago. And so, um, but, but I don't wanna take all this time talking specifically about what Missing Middle is, but rather I'm gonna talk about a range of our projects and you'll notice that the concepts of missing middle are really inherent in a majority of these projects that I'll talk with you about. So the first thing I wanted to discuss is, is how we're using design thinking to guide the change within the single family home industry utilizing missing middle housing. And um, I wanted to use our Muse Homes project as, a, as just a short case study. We, I got a call from Spencer Holmes now a little over three years ago. Um, he owns, his family owns one of the largest production builders in the Salt Lake City region. And Spencer had two problems. Um, first of all, uh, Spencer, uh, their business was established to design, to build large suburban single family homes. 
but he understood that the market was shifting, but he had no idea how to adapt his business to respond. And number two, the cost of land, the cost of labor, the cost of materials and cost of entitlement had gone up so much that they could not even deliver a conventional townhouse type at a price point that an entry level household could could afford. And so he was wondering if we and sort of utilizing our missing middle expertise could um, sort of help him solve this issue. And so we were really anxious uh, to get pencil to paper to help him solve uh, this these issues that he was having. And so as a starting point, uh, we made a site challenge, a design opportunity. Um, our client bought uh, two fairly large blocks within a larger master plan community called Daybreak. And part of the challenge was these blocks were bigger than we as good urbanists would typically design, but they weren't quite big enough to split up with the addition of new streets. And so the way we approached this is we split both of the two large blocks into a series of four microscale blocks using a pedestrian only paseo or what we call the muse that connects both east, west and north, north south through the site and, and, and connects to a nearby uh, elementary school as well. And the other uh, design aspect of this problem is then, or the design challenge is what do we do with the 26 foot deep lot that is remaining a sort of, that's engaging and activating the muse space. And so the idea that we came up with is let's take a typical townhouse, which is usually about 25 foot on its frontage and 35, 40 plus or minus foot deep on, on its width. And let's flip it 45 degrees and make the long side the frontage. And sort of not only does this sort of uh, enable us to utilize that narrow lot, but it also creates a really a wonderful uh, living condition that you see here on the left of a housing type with much better natural light than a conventional townhouse. So this, um, the compact site plan, the simple building form and the small footprints of these buildings enabled our client to deliver these um, Muse homes at price points of about $25,000 to $30,000 less than their conventional townhouse. So it definitely enabled them to achieve that, that goal of theirs. Um, and in addition, um, right, this master plan, as well as the housing types, delivered a really high quality community. And all of these housing types, or these, these homes actually were sold before the, com the construction was even completed. So that told a lot about the pent up demand for these uh, diversity of housing choices. So in addition to our client being happy, um, residents being happy to live in these choices, the development community and the construction industry has responded and are really excited about some of these ideas. This project got highlighted in a professional building magazine article. Uh, it won a gold nugget award last year, sorry, in 2019, and also won a CNU charter award that very same year. So really exciting project. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of a project case study and how we use design thinking is how we um, are redefining multifamily by utilizing missing middle housing. And I think we all understand this issue here in terms of the way we deliver multifamily now, which is in an isolated, auto-oriented, placeless pattern. Uh, this photo happens to be from the Omaha, Nebraska metro, but it could really be any place throughout the United States that have really developed in these same patterns. And so our question and sort of what we really sort of as new urbanists and as we've been thinking about missing middle housing, we knew that we could do better. Um, we wanted to demonstrate how we could deliver multifamily in a neighborhood pattern like we have historically. Like it shouldn't really be that hard, but we've, we, we haven't been doing it. Um, so this project um, that we're able to demonstrate this concept on is called Prairie Queen, and it's in um, Papillion, Nebraska, which is in the, the larger Omaha metro. And it's, it'll be the country's first all-missing middle housing neighborhood. So the idea, the design idea is quite simple. Let's design buildings that look like a mansion, you know, turn-of-the-century neighborhoods uh, in Omaha and these other nearby cities that people really love. But let's, instead of those being single, unit buildings, let's add two, three, four, five, up to six or seven units uh, within that same form. And this is really the premise behind missing middle housing very generally, but the client got really excited about this idea. So um, inherent in this idea, and one of the initial responses we usually get from 
from developers who we're talking to about this is the, the one challenge is that building more buildings and smaller buildings um, costs more, sort of on initial sort of, if you're looking at this in a very traditional way or conventional way that builders look at it. So we challenge ourselves about where can we find cost efficiencies without compromising the quality of the, the living environment as well as the broader neighborhood. And so we came up with this system or the, the kit of parts as we often call it to provide some of those efficiencies. And so the system starts with a shared set of unit plans and our client was really interested in working with us, uh, sort of define the, the parameters for those unit plans and sort of where the market was. So you put those unit plans together in a variety of different ways to create a palette of, of missing middle housing types that range from duplex up to eight plexes and then also townhouses. And then, right, you combine a variety of those missing middle housing types on every block um, to uh, create your, 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 the variety that you want within your neighborhood. And so, and then you put the blocks together to create the neighborhood. I think you know, really basic concepts for us as urbanists and urbanists generally, but this is not the way that multifamily developers think or even multifamily architects think as either. So um, the thing about this project, it's about delivering a variety of different addresses uh, throughout the project and throughout the neighborhood. And this project even has a neighborhood main street. It's in a very suburban isolated location but that neighborhood main street, even with just 132 units built, already has a thriving pizza shop and a yoga studio. And so we're looking forward to other uses that will be delivered to that neighborhood as part of that main street. So you compare this, uh, the image, an aerial image of the first 132 units built and occupied to the placeless, isolated apartment complex, my first slide, and you can immediately sort of see and begin to feel differences uh, in the, the change that we're demonstrating in this approach to this project. And so uh, the next 100 units are now in various stages, sort of just working its way down to the lake you can see on the right. And what this project is doing is it's delivering a very strong sense of place in the neighborhood and a community that people want to stay in. They're not sort of when they get the chance and, and have enough money saved up, they wanna move out to a different place. And it's really just ultimately a better place to call home for more, more, for more people, better choices. So the, the third example that I wanted to talk about is um, us using our design thinking and being in the position over the last couple of years, and this is one of the projects I'm probably most excited about, to, to, to prove that there's a demand for car-free, mobility-rich living. And in particular, that type of living outside the urban cores at more of this missing middle and neighborhood scale. Um, so we were hired by a post car real estate developer whose name is called the sack, ironically, um, to test their vision for delivering car free living on this 18 acre site in Tempe, Arizona. So this will be the first car free neighborhood built for showed, shared mobility when it comes out of the ground later this year. It's fully entitled and going through um, building permits for the first phases. And we're super excited about kind of where this design went. So what is, what is shared mobility you probably wanna know? So um, this is an element that our clients brought to the table that we were super, super excited about. So the site was adjacent to a light rail station, which as a starting point is a really great um, sort of car-free uh, context um, uh, element. But in addition to that, um, there's gonna be ride share zones for convenient pickup and drop off throughout the project. There's um, on-site, uh, car share pods distributed throughout the project area so you can go online and, and sign up to use a car for an hour, for two hours, or for a day, sort of at your fingertips. There's also e-bike and scooter infrastructure sort of as, as, as carefully located throughout the site, as well as um, sidewalk delivery robots that will be delivering sort of groceries, uh, restaurant deliveries, and similar to the residents of this particular project. So it's kind of the new thinking very progressively and big picture about mobility and the way people are living. So the foundation um, for this design approach is a system of unique and repeatable building types, somewhat similar to the system that we created for um, the Prairie Queen neighborhood. But what was great about this project is it wasn't just about removing cars from conventional housing types, but also rethinking the housing types in the process as well. Um, so this was the kit of parts and the system of housing types as the foundation. 
So in terms of composing the block though, you can see that um, the design approach was extremely different um, than what we did in Prairie Queen because of the harsh desert climate that this project is located within. Um, even, uh, even though there's repetition in the housing types, it's not very noticeable because of the, each block is different and the, the, or the, the, the orientation of the building creates a system of different sizes and shapes of, and a network of courtyards within the internal uh, block itself. So we took an approach on this project that the architecture would be thoughtfully restrained, um, would let the buildings play their role as fabric buildings and define and activate the public spaces. And by the way, 60% of the project is public space because of the removal of the cars. So we studied um, really great region, regional examples like Barrio Viejo in Tucson. Um, and we also uh, studied, we, we, we discovered a really great Egyptian architect called Hassan Bafi, who was very inspiring for our work, as well as I would, I would imagine that sort of having spent the previous summer in Puglia in Southern Italy and thinking about a trip to, to Greece that summer while we were working on this project, probably had a little, little bit of influence in terms of the, the real fabulous simplicity, but beauty that's inherent in all those Greek and Southern Italian villages. Um, the urbanism and the architecture is very much rooted in this desert context, and they're very much um, sort of informed by sort of the harsh desert climate. So the removal of the car meant that we could really focus on sort of that as the primary driver of the master planning as well as the building types. And so this is just a view of the, the main plaza on the lower right-hand side there where the mixed-use component of the project will deliver a small market, a co-living space, coffee shop, and other food and beverage amenities. Um, the design process is iterative. Um, we like to roll up our sleeves with our multidisciplinary team members and be inspired in our design thinking process, right? This, these types of, types of processes include transportation, retail, landscape, economists, and sort of this collaborative nature is just an inherent part of our design thinking process. Um, Cul-de-sac's public launch in 2019 garnered 335 million press impressions. So you can say just at the very least that people were interested in this. It, it was featured in articles in Forbes, Fast Company, and the Wall Street Journal. And the media continues to be very interested in this story about delivering car-free living in a context, in a, an environment that historically was a very auto-dependent environment. And so um, not only is this gonna deliver car-free living, but it's going to deliver in an urban environment unlike any place has been built in this region and maybe even built in the United States in the past several hundred years. So then I'm gonna shift uh, the conversation away from that sort of building and neighborhood scale and sort of shift up the scale to the city and the county scale um, where we've done quite a bit of work over the past years in particular. And as, as, as Karen mentioned, as our form-based coding practice grew from sort of the project area, neighborhood and corridor up to the city and county scale, we started to get, at, we, our clients started asking us if we would sort of lead them through a comprehensive planning process as well. And so we sort of, um, the challenge was how to adapt our typical process and our unique understanding of the built environment to these larger scales in a way that we could generalize it, um, but without compromising the results in the place-based nature of our approach. And how do we establish an entire city and countywide planning system based on this understanding of place and form? And so um, I'm gonna talk briefly about two projects. Um, the first one is the Kauai County General Plan. Um, and uh, we were part of a team to complete this plan a number of years ago, I think it was four years ago. And um, one thing we discovered early on is that in the Hawaiian culture, um, the relationship between the natural environment and the built environment is extremely important. It's a very high priority. So we utilize that understanding to um, sort of analyze the place, understand the culture and define a place, a, a, a pellet of place types specific to this rural context, this amazing uh, rural and natural context as a foundation for this countywide and islandwide comprehensive plan rather than using densities FARs and allowed uses as the foundation. So you can imagine just as an example, this is Kaloa Town, a really great little, what we classified as a small village with the, the, the remains of the plantation in this quadrant to the right. And then the undeveloped site to the left, you could imagine the negative impact that the development of a large strip mall would have on this site, which the, the previous zoning code would have allowed. 
And so we had a really great conversation about how this placement foundation can establish the right type of development, um, the right scale form in relationship to the existing development in the natural context as a goal of the, not only the comprehensive plan, but also the, the, the zoning that would put in place. Um, so we as urbanists often sort of immediately jump to the transfor transformational sort of scale, the big picture scale of change. But that's not always what the community wants, number one, and it's not always possible in the short term for either political reasons, economic reasons, or other. And so we, as we've done in our previous projects as well, we sort of use this abil our ability and process to discuss various degrees of change, kind of going from small, medium, and large, and in discussing how even the smallest of the changes can benefit the community, and we build the support for these changes based on this understanding that we built for them. And so um, this place types and desired degrees of changes becomes the island-wide framework for growth and evolution, as well as preservation of the natural context. And so now we're systematically working our way around this island to each of these place types and doing more detailed uh, sort of area planning and rewriting the zoning and, and replacing it with form-based coding to implement that plan. Um, I'm gonna jump back to Memphis um, and Karen talked a little bit about this, but um, we thought it was worth diving a little bit deeper into a few elements of this approach. Um, uh, basically in this project, um, we were utilizing our understanding of the built, built environment, our analysis of existing conditions, the culture of the community, um, to create a strategy to redirect investment back into central city neighborhoods after nearly 100 years of disinvestment. And this disinvestment most greatly impacted the communities of color that were a large percent, made up a large percentage of, of many of those uh, central city neighborhoods. So um, Karen mentioned the process, but one thing I wanted to mention is that we wanted to get the people, all of the community members at the table, even those that don't per typically participate in a planning process. And so we created, we worked with the city to identify 45 neighborhood partners that had existing relationship and the trust of the community members to get a broader range of community members to the table and to have their voices heard and reflected within this plan. And Karen mentioned the anchors um, as a core strategy of this plan, but the two things that I wanted to mention and reinforce is that number one is that the term, the anchor term and the concept was chosen by the community. And number two is that the community members helped us identify where these existing um, anchors, where the anchors existed in their communities. And thirdly, what the characteristics of them were that they wanted to protect and what they would like to change. And so uh, similar to Kauai, and this was work with strategic economics and Karen mentioned is a cult cultivating the change with small as well as large scales investment. And I think it's, you know, thinking about small changes like simply adding sidewalks in a neighborhood that can drastically improve the quality of life for residents in addition to those larger moves to encourage um, development throughout some of these neighborhoods. So we didn't stop at the high level policy and citywide sort of planning scale. Over the course of 21 months, we worked with the city to create 14 detailed district plans um, to prove the anchor and test the anchor and the degree of change designations. And this process was very thoughtfully structured by the city. And Karen mentioned this, but I wanted to reinforce it so that staff, local consultants, as well as university students could be mentored by national experts as opposed to national experts coming in and saying this is the way it should be done. And the great re result of that is the city of Memphis has been able to hire three of those planning students after they graduated to be full-time members of their planning staff. And as, as Karen mentioned, uh, there were immediate and uh, really positive impacts. The fact that 70% of all investment the year that the first year the plan was adopted happened within these defined anchors is a, is a true testament to the effectiveness of the process in the plan. So the last thing I wanna talk about is, um, this is gonna be really quick, is I just wanted to talk about utilizing missing middle housing to unlock investment potential in distressed neighborhoods. And I particularly wanted to just talk about this case study because it's local to you all. Um, this is the near Northwest neighborhood strategic plan that we worked on with the city of South Bend a few years ago. And um, now the project area, um, sort of is defined here. And I think the, the, you probably are all fairly familiar with this area, but I wanted to mention that the, the area that needed the most um, attention 
was the area between Portage Avenue on the north side and Lincoln Way West on the south side. And the city very thoughtfully, uh, within that even area, that area in need, defined a, a pilot area, a, a two block area between, that included Sherman Avenue and Harrison Avenue that really was sort of the focus area of where the change and in investment should happen first. And so as part of our systems thinking in a project like this, you know, the city had the foresight to ask the question, you know, could missing middle housing, if it were enabled by zoning, unlock development potential and investment in this neighborhood, improve the quality of living? And so as part of this strategy or systems thinking is we took the series of lot sizes that existed in this neighborhood and we defined the range of housing types that fit on those lots. And then we worked with the Incremental Development Alliance who ran pro forma analysis for each of those types to make sure the types would actually pencil out as they were designed or we either removed them from the palette if they didn't or changed the design so if they did pencil out. And so in terms of the impact on this neighborhood, the, the great news is, is that the city has already um, changed the zoning for this neighborhood to allow these range of missing middle types well, the current conditions is that about 70% of the lots are currently vacant, and this is the pilot area that was identified. But that, if you think about this in terms of how it would potentially sort of um, get implemented over the course of the first five to seven years, it's likely that there's going to be very small incremental local investment that will happen as part of this uh, strategy by the city. Uh, secondarily, sort of in the next sort of series of years, 10 to 12 years, sort of the economics, once those first projects are proven, the economics will be proven so that local banks would be more comfortable sort of giving financing for construction loans and sort of more investment will spread. Uh, sort of uh, partners like the churches with these neighborhoods may start to invest in their the properties that they own. And then, you know, the point of this is like, this is something that will happen very incrementally and that the, the removal of the single family zoning over the course of 10, 15, and even 20 years enables the repair and the, the incremental infill uh, of this particular neighborhood. And the great thing is, is that this example can serve as a model for other neighborhoods within South Bend, but can also serve as a model of smaller neighborhoods across the country. So we're really excited to work with the city of South Bend on that uh, local example. So in closing, um, I just wanna mention that um, this is absolutely a team effort. Um, we, in terms of Karen and Stefan and I, we provide leadership within Opticos, but it's really our teams and our just high quality team and our committed team that really makes all this possible. So our current team as well as our past team. And so we just have to give credit where credit is due to our team. I say that in terms of what we, we are focusing on and thinking about working on next, I think a lot of our work is gonna continue to focus on the very important issue of dealing with um, a, a racial justice and the inherent racial systems in our planning and zoning systems. Um, we're also going to continue to sort of be on the forefront of promoting a broader range of more attainable housing choices and walkable communities across the country with the missing middle and our project work. And then, you know, the our client in cul-de-sac wants to take the, the car-free living to a citywide scale. So we, we're looking forward to sort of growing that um, city, or car-free living concept um, to, a, to a city-wide scale. And I think that ultimately, um, really we wanna use our work and our design thinking and, and the opportunities that we identify within Opticos to utilize our business as a force for good. Thank you. Thank you, Dan and Karen. Um, I want to ask now if anybody from the audience has any questions, you can submit them using the Q&A button down at the bottom. And whenever you do that, if you can note to me if you are having any speaker or microphone issues and you'd rather I read the question for you. Um, before I get started with, with that list, um, Stephanos and Phil, do either one of you have any questions? I, I would like the, those, uh, those assembled to ask questions first. Okay, um, I'm waiting for those to come in, which is why I went to you first, but we'll, we'll try. Um, I did have a question that came in from Jennifer Garcia um, in part of her registration, so even beforehand. Uh, so Jennifer, did you wanna ask that question verbally? All right, while we wait for her, I'll get started on her question, um, which is as a designer based in California where affordable housing requirements in the overarching housing crisis looms. 
How have you been able to address the overwhelming need to maximize density throughout the state while advocating for form-based codes? You know, I think in, in places like, like most of California markets and other high value markets, uh, the reality is the, the, the biggest opportunity and the place where that's gonna have the most impact is targeting areas identified and, and currently zoned for single family um, for a thoughtful application of missing middle is, is my belief because in, 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 in areas where there's already um, zoning for higher densities, um, or even commercial projects that sort of drive a higher value than what a missing middle scaled project would, you're, you're not gonna, you're, a developer's not gonna develop missing middle. So, so it's gonna be likely like, like Berkeley did last night and this, the state has been um, looking at statewide legislation to do similar, but I think just being very thoughtful, but also thinking broadly about um, where we may need to remove single family zoning to enable broader application of missing middle. I think that's just the reality in, in places like California and, and higher higher value markets. Dan, do you want to talk too about how to, we've, I, I mean, we've actually been having this conversation recently um, about how do we enable, we want people to maximize units, not maximize size. Do you want to talk some about how we do that? So, so a what couple we're talking of things. about. Well, there's a couple of things is what happens in many markets, including here in Berkeley, in the few spaces where missing middle is actually zoned, or, or like it's three to four units on a 50 foot five lot, is a lot of developers will default to delivering three tall, skinny, single family detached houses that, you know, they'll buy a $1.2 million bungalow, they'll tear it down and build four detached tall, skinny homes, and they'll each sell for $1.2 million. And so number one, this isn't it's delivering more housing, but it's number one, it's not delivering any sort of attainability in terms of price, but it's also delivering really bad urban form. And it's a, as an exception in terms of one or two on a block, it's okay, but you can imagine the impact to the urban environment if the whole block became this really bad type um, or similar, a, a town, sort of the, the slot townhouse example. The other thing is we're, we're telling cities to be thoughtful about not, I think just to be frank, the state of Oregon and the city of Minneapolis sort of missed the mark a little bit in that they said, we're gonna allow up to three to four units on a lot. So what that's gonna do is it's gonna encourage builders to build three or four of the biggest units that the zoning will allow. Um, and those probably aren't gonna be attainable either. So what we're, we're encouraging cities like Berkeley and others to do is let's define the, the desired building envelope, the width, the height, and the depth, and let a developer do two larger units, four medium units, or eight micro or studio size units within that so that they can deliver smaller, more attainable homes within that context. So we, we have been giving this quite a bit of thought um, in terms of uh, effective implementation. Jennifer, did you have any follow-up on that? Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Um, Kurt Zimmerman, Kurt, did you wanna ask your question? Sure, I am curious how, how uh, if you have magic words to say to some of these city planners that uh, are, they're impatient and how do you cultivate that kind of patience and it, you know, build, uh, allow some of your plans to grow organically. Like they're so well tuned to that. They wanna grow like that. and. They, you know, they're so anxious to see results immediately. You know, in my city in Milwaukee, we've got some great downtown parcels, but the city is more interested in selling off entire blocks to developers. And we get these faceless, soulless pieces where I think if you were to parcel it into smaller bits, you could get that kind of organic urban growth that is natural, that the whole city was built on initially and, you, you know, let it evolve. What do you say? <laughs> yeah, I think the um, part, part of this is just rethinking economic development and really thinking about placemaking and even form-based coding or zoning reform generally as the best economic development strategy a city can take on in terms of 
placemaking, right, the best thing they can do is allow the smaller, more incremental projects to happen. A, a colleague of mine, um, Jim Tischler, who's the, the in charge of the, the, the State Land Bank in Michigan, goes to the sort of annual economic development conference, like the conference every year. And last year, he, he sent me a text like halfway through the conference and said, that the keynote speaker at this economic development conference just said that the number one priority for cities in terms of economic development should be placemaking, period. And so like, there's a change happening, um, it's slow, but I think that's part of it, is just them understanding that there's value in thinking more organically or incrementally and not sort of waiting for the, the, the one big project that, I mean, really historically has shown to be an ineffective way to try to revitalize a, an urban urban neighborhood or a downtown, and also is is wrought with a lot of risk because if that one project doesn't succeed, it leaves a really big scar on on that um, urban area. And I I think you also we have to make broaden the conversations to talk about you know when this is all finished. Not only what does it look like, but who owns it? Um, because ownership is a big deal, and when we create, when we write zoning codes that allow smaller developers to get in the game because they're less risky, they're more understandable, the rules are straightforward, um, it actually enables then local ownership at the end of the day. And when you tie this to, you know, the conversations around local economies, and when you spend the dollar in the local economy, it stays and it, it circulates through the local economy, you know, something like 30 times before it goes outside of the economy. How do we get local ownership so that so that every dollar you're spent in, including your rent if you're renting is being spent in the local economy and that often requires smaller developers smaller projects um, and and developers and builders who are of the community and thinking about the community when they're developing and those are often are smaller projects they're not block size projects and we have to start talking about that it really matters next question is from professor john meller Hi, Dan. Hi, Karen. How are you? I have a Good, hey, John. Question. I actually have hey, a two-part question for you. Um, I'm fascinated by your Memphis project, um, and I'm particularly fascinated by this idea that Memphis has sort of grown recklessly over time since the 1920s, and that what really needs to happen is the city needs to get smaller, and they need to refocus their investment of very limited resources that they have. So what I'm curious, and here's my two-part question, number one, how is the idea of Mem that Memphis needs to get smaller been received by people in Memphis? And then number two, how does the notion that the city needs to shrink, how does it affect its tax base? Is the idea then that a smaller city needs to have a necessarily higher tax base because the quality of what's in the city is better and it taxes out at a higher rate? Um, so I'm, I'm, that's what I'm kind of curious about. How does all of this rethinking about Memphis um, change the way the, the funding systems work? You know, I, um, Stefan would be the best person to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> He's not here. Um, but generally speaking, I don't think they actually talked a whole lot about shrinking the city. I think that's, a, again, communicating carefully within the community about what your intentions and goals are shrinking the city wasn't part of the conversation. It was about limited resources and limited investment resources. So if we have limited resources, what do we do with those resources? And that's where it became a proactive conversation around where do we want to focus those resources and what can we do with it? And then you pair that with, okay, you as the community, where are the places that matter most to you? Where can we I call it like the the kind of spark, you know, where are the places that are the spark of a community, right? And that's where those anchors came about. So by, by finding the places where people gather, whether it's a retail gathering or, you know, a library or the, you know, some an outdoor park or something like that, but where they gather and you can create a spark, well, then someone can open, you know, a little hot dog cart or a coffee cart, or someone can bring in their, their, you know, food truck and um, and serve tacos on the corner and it starts to build. And so what are where are the sparks in the community that either already exist, it's already happening or well, mostly where it's already existing, but it may not look like it's happening by doing a Google map study. And then, and then what's the, you know, I think that degree of change that Dan talked about is really important. And the language in Memphis was around nurturing 
Um, I don't remember the other two language, the other two, but the language they picked was really careful around like um, not being dismissive of what already exists and and how are we nurturing places or preparing them for more investment? You know, how are we preparing places for investment so that they don't become gentrified? Those sorts of, those were kind of the, the foci, focuses of the conversation. Um, and that enabled the conversation to say, because when we, when we first got involved, you know, there, downtown Memphis is a very defined place. And then a lot of the, the spread of Memphis was actually about spreading outside of the city into county lands because people didn't want to pay city taxes and they didn't want to be involved in the city. And that growth took place along three major corridors. There are three major east-west corridors. And so the, the, the study that had been done before we came in said, well, all, all investment and all planning should happen along these three corridors because that's where people are traveling back and forth. And so it was actually a major shift to say, no, 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 no. That's not what this is about at all. It's like it's finding the places within the existing Memphis community that deserve investment. Um, and how do we do that so that we're not actually talking about spreading? And by switching that conversation, then all of a sudden the conversation was it inherently helps them focus, which will potentially shrink the city, but that language is never used um, in that. And then I think the tax, that is the, you know, the tax base piece of it becomes part of it also that like you're focusing on the city, not outside the city. And you're trying to make the city a wonderful place for everyone living there and people living on county lands to consider re, re coming into and strengthening the city that way. Dan, were you going to say something? The, the city did something completely unprecedented as far as I know, is they, through careful analysis, identified areas at the edges that couldn't pay their own way, that, this, that there was an economic drain on the city and the rest of the neighborhoods, and they de-annexed 10% of the geographic area of the city hmm. um, as a starting point. So that was a huge political sort of making a statement. And I think that in terms of the tax base, I think it was really about, as Karen mentioned, so that money that they were bleeding to sort of help keep these suburban environments that couldn't pay for themselves sort of going was then reinvested back in sort of these neighborhoods that were identified in need of that investment. And, and um, I, I think in that they could, that could benefit those existing communities. And so uh, the city just did some really progressive work um, on that front to make sure number one, it was communicated effectively, there was support for it and they weren't afraid to make tough decisions. So it was, it was great. It's good to hear. Um, just a last follow up really quick. Um, I know that um, Joe Minicosi and Chuck Marone both have done work down in Memphis. Did they work? Did you work alongside of them? Were they working independent of you? Were you kind of influencing each other? Or is it all this happening at the same time? Um, I wasn't aware, actually. I mean, we often do follow Strong Towns and Joe Minicosi around on projects, but um, I actually wasn't aware that they had done work down there. So maybe they were they did speakers, speaker series or some consulting prior to the plan, but um, their work is obviously really helps to lay a foundation of understanding in terms of like Joe's work of like, and I guess in strong towns of uh, Chuck's work of like, where should a city be spending its money and where is it sustainable for cities to spend their money? So that, that sort of conversation obviously would be foundational to sort of enabling the city to make the decision they did. But um, I, I just, I actually wasn't aware that they were, they had done work there. Well, very good. Then uh, they must all be working out great uh, all around. Uh, thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Great to hear from you. All right. For those of you who didn't know, John and, I, John and Dan and I were the same class, class of 95. Um, Dan, now you made me feel like we ordered the lecture series wrong because Joe Manicosi is coming to speak in a couple of weeks. Um, I didn't I saw that. No I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to come back and review the tape on, on this one after. Um, we have a question from a student, Matthew, if you want to. Sure. Um, so I was wondering about sort of one of the dimensions of addressing racial and social justice through your work, in particular with <laughs> engagement. Um, I'm familiar with some social science literature that shows that people who participate in like municipal government and neighborhood meetings tend to be whiter, wealthier, and older than the overall community. And I was wondering, you spoke to one way of addressing this with the Memphis project, but I was wondering if there were any other ways in other projects that you sought to address that or just overall, if that's been reflected in your experience with charrettes and things like that. 
Yeah, it's absolutely an issue, Matthew. Thank you for for raising that. And um, I, you know, it, number one, you have to be aware of the issue, right? So awareness of who you're engaging, and that's a big part of what I was talking about at the beginning of the presentation, and why I wanted to talk about it is because awareness of these issues is is super critical because we can't fix them if we're not aware of them. So that that often is the case, and um, it's where working with the city, especially for a firm like ours, where we're working, you know, we work all over. We don't have a presence in a lot of the cities that we work in. So raising with the city and the city staff the issue early and often and talking with them and, and iterating and, you know, making a plan for how we're going to get the community engaged. When we worked in Austin, we actually had four different sub consultants that were specialists in different aspects of the community. Um, and had different specialties, different culture interests. Um, and, you know, in Memphis, again, we knew that we weren't going to be the one to be able to make sure that happened. But thankfully, the city was already on it even before we got there. And um, what we're finding, I think what I would say is it's an, it's a known issue. Um, it's a challenging issue, but it's a necessary issue that we have to address. And so we're actively, in fact, we were just uh, had a meeting this morning with our senior staff today talking about our R&D projects. And continuing to look at our community engagement practices is one of the things that's still on our list. Um, I think we have hope that um, what the pandemic has done is brought new tools to the table or gotten a lot more people more comfortable with different tools. The reality is that smartphone access is, is actually very high in most communities. Um, and looking at digital access for some communities um, is really strong. You know, particularly young, uh, young uh, and urban, and uh, very culturally diverse populations. Um, so there's some potential there that, as we um, recover from the pandemic, looking at ways to integrate the digital technologies like we're doing today with the in-person meetings and how do we do that. I think being really culturally sensitive. You know, when you look at typically like Black communities tend to gather when it's actually gathering around food and sustenance. And that goes back to the history of slavery and when they needed, those, that was the only chance they had to gather, right? And there's a strong history there. And so how do we really engage in ways that they are comfortable and belong um, and, it's, and it's a viable part of their life? I think there's, there's so much to look into this um, and bringing in expert, increasingly experts are more visible that, that do this kind of work. Um, and I think the, the, um, and, you know, and then working with community organizations, that's the other thing I wanted to say. I do think it is really difficult. Municipal budgets are tiny and getting and shrinking by the day. And especially after this pandemic, um, we're really concerned about what's going to happen at the local level. Um, and doing community outreach work takes time. You just have to have the time to do it. And, um, and so figuring out how to do that, um, and make it a priority um, with the council and their budgets or figuring out other ways to do it. And that's where in Memphis, the 45 community organization partners that were part of that process. You know, if we if we spread our network to their network, then their network spreads the word beyond that. And that was actually really critical to getting a lot of people to the table that normally wouldn't have been part of this process. And so looking at the ways that we can connect networks um, out in the community um, is another really important piece of that. So, I mean, we could have a whole hour long conversation about that, Matthew, and I'm happy to do so at some point, but hopefully that gets at some of your questions. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for asking. So I have a, a few questions now that, that people have asked me to um, read on their behalf. The first one is from Professor Kim Rawlings. Uh, thank you for a great talk that included social justice, co-creation and listening and participatory practices. Um, she wants to know how do issues of accessibility and universal design factor into both your process and your projects? Yeah, I think it's the same. It's the same. Awareness is the first challenge and making sure we're aware of those issues and and thoughtful about them. Um, I think the um, the. Um, when we even when we talk about walkable communities, I cringe a little bit at the term walkable because we're then we're not talking about people in wheelchairs, although actually for folks who have vision impairment, walkable communities can actually be a really um, um, beneficial place to live here in Berkeley. We actually have one of the strongest um, communities focused on accessibility um, in the country. A lot of people move here for that. So 
so being aware, being thoughtful about it and factoring it into the design um, as you go is is super important. I think the um, you have to think about it on the community engagement front on kind of whose access, you know, whether it's language access, whether it's captions, whether it's um, doing sign language, knowing the community. And I think that's part of also where working with our community um, partners to understand the needs and factoring that in. Um, and that's a challenge too, just like everything else, all of this costs money and local budgets are tiny. And so the more we raise these, these issues and thank you for bringing it up because the more we raise the issues and remind people how important it is and, and make sure it's part of the process. Um, and then I, and then for the design issues too, I mean, we're designing, we want not just accessibility, but visibility and making sure that everyone can, um, can visit and be part of the community, can visit their neighbors and be part of their communities, not just access their own homes. So. Um, that is part of what we look at. And I think, I actually think, I do a lot of uh, volunteer work here in Berkeley on the transportation sector. I'm on our transportation commission. Um, and um, and I'm a founder of a group called Walk Bike Berkeley here in Berkeley. Um, and a big part of the work too I'm finding is I think that the mobility, um, for, for people with um, physical mobility issues, um, that the the talk around mobility choice has been really helpful because it's talking about not just folks in wheelchairs, like talking with making a place that works for people with scooters also makes a place that works for people with wheelchairs and talking about shorter crossing distances for streets are, are helpful for everyone involved. Um, and um, I, have, I am personally finding a lot of traction and getting attention to the ability issues in the mobility conversation and mobility choice conversation too. So. I have one more that I'm going to read and then Phil, you're up, you're up next um, for your question as well. Uh, this one is from um, <clears throat> Michael Lee Kudis. Uh, I am somewhat dubious of technological delivery systems, such as the robots and drones um, that you mentioned. What about central delivery stations where people can pick up packages? It seems more ecological and more civic. Uh, specifically, why can't we look for human connections rather than technological solutions? Okay, before I let Dan jump in on that one, I want to tell a story about another Notre Dame um, alum, uh, Caroline uh, Caroline Swinehart, who's now Caroline Cochran, just got married. She's uh, one of our Opticos team members. And we have those little mobility, it looked just like the picture on that Dan had. It looks like a little cooler on wheels riding delivery around robots. Berkeley, delivery robots before. Um, but they have a picture of eyes on them. And so uh, Caroline came up on one of them on a sidewalk one day in downtown Berkeley and she she went up to it and she stopped right in front of it to see what it would do. And it kind of jerked around and she kind of moved around to still stop it and kind of was like pushing it to try to get in its way to see what would happen. Um, and those of you who know Caroline, she was an undergraduate psychology major. So she's telling the story, she was moving around. And finally the eyes on this on this device turned into these like, Oh, please let me go by. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she's like, it just melted her heart and she moved out of the way and let the thing went on. But I thought it, I think it's a really interesting story about our interaction with devices as well as people. And I agree with you personally, Michael, that um, I think human interaction and ways to get out and you know, my my parents and I'm sure many of your parents talk about the one time they get out during the day sometimes is to walk to the mailbox and pick up their mail, you know. Um, so I think being thoughtful about that is uh, is super important. And um, I know we think it's really interesting that our client is focused on those things, but I don't think it actually came up a lot in our design conversations. Our design conversations were more about pedestrians and scooters and cyclists and kind of moving people through the space. I think that was a side note of theirs, but I, I personally agree with you. I think human interaction, especially as we've now focused in this pandemic, is so important. and. Um, and that's really what these designs are about, is about creating places for people to come together. Dan, you want to dive in? So one of the overarching uh, principles of the project, in, in addition to Car Free, was just really reinforcing a strong sense of community. And so, um, right, the technology could completely go away. And because the patterns are based on sort of proven patterns of, of traditional urbanism, it could completely function without that technology. The technology might disappear tomorrow or or next week or next year. So um, I think that's that's important is it's 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 um, community is really important. There's like I mentioned 60% of the site is allocated for public space because we didn't have to allocate space for cars. There's a tremendous 
uh, courtyard network, um, shared courtyard network within each block. Um, there's also a, a really fine grained network of uh, really narrow paseos and small uh, medium plazas uh, in addition to the main plaza space. And so, and there are, um, there are actually lockers for deliveries in other parts of the project. So similar to the way we typically gang mailboxes to try to create a little bit of a civic and element where people sort of rub elbows with their neighbors that definitely exists and was part of um, the thinking. Um, and and the, the technology definitely was not driving the design, which was great. It was the, we were just sort of making sure we were accommodating it within the, the desired form and pattern we were trying to establish that was being responsive to the, this, this climate. Okay, um, Bill, do you wanna ask your question and then I'll get back to a few more. Yeah, uh, if I may. So th this is a question really about um, sort of the, the higher end density of middle housing. Um, Chicago is, is Chicago has a lot of middle housing um, still that um, is, is very well used. Uh, but I'm thinking of two types in particular. And this is a question that has to do with parking uh, because uh, there are a lot of corner buildings, uh, uh, apartment buildings in Chicago that are three stories uh, with 12 units. Uh, there are a lot of mid block uh, U-court buildings that, that have you know, 30 dwelling units, um, sometimes more. Uh, you know, on a on a site that um, that might be you know ninety to one hundred feet wide and one hundred twenty five feet deep, which which is a uh, uh, actually uh, approximates a density closer to Paris <laughs> uh, than uh, uh, anyway. But it, but neither of those uh, neither of those have any off street parking, and um, and of course Chicago has good enough public transportation that 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 works. But uh, all of those buildings, and there are thousands of them, tens of thousands of them throughout the city that work fine, but um, it's no longer possible to build them new, right? Because of, uh, because of the existing parking requirements. And I'm just wondering what kind of um, success you've had or, or uh, you know, where, where's, the, where's the line drawn in your experience with middle housing? Because uh, it's easy enough to park cars you know, for a six unit building or a four unit building or something like that. But when you start getting up into 12 or into 30, uh, have you been able to, to crack that nut? Uh, even in a place like, like the Bay Area that has, you know, good public transportation, what, what's been your experience? So, so as, a, as a reference point, um, the Prairie Queen neighborhood that I showed was the, and I, I hate to use density, but it's right, the term we use, it's density as an output as opposed to an input, which is a Tony Perez um, statement, but it was the maximum density that we could get by um, uh, uh, basically accommodating one off-street parking space per unit, and then the rest of the parking was accommodated on the street, or assumed it would be taken on this, we had enough space on the street to do like another one and a half per unit. And that's a very suburban environment. So, so yeah. if it's working, and it's working, it's working really well there. Even in an environment like Nebraska, where it gets cold, and oh, people want everybody wants a garage is always one of the comments. So, so and that was at about um, it was right at about twenty units per acre overall, including all the open space um, in that project, which is pretty substantial uh, with a creek corridor. But um, you know, we tell I often tell cities um, that. The, for bigger cities like a Chicago or a more urban place like that, you know, if you're requiring more than half a space off street, I mean, I, number one, I'm a proponent of like, let's get rid of parking and let the market decide. Um, but um, at the very most, like a quarter to one space per unit is what cities should be requiring if they want to require parking. And in sort of smaller or more suburban markets, we found that anything more than one off-street parking space per unit is gonna make the missing middle types either cost prohibitive or physically impossible on small lots. And so, right, the developers then gonna to wanna to jump up to a, a podium uh, building, sort of the generic podium apartment building that you see happening everywhere. Is, is I, will... there, I just wanna say, follow up in the Bay Area, is there any kind of, um you know, relaxation of, of parking requirements for, for those higher, higher density um, middle housing types. Yeah, we just, well, here in Berkeley, we had in November, the election in November um, kind of uh, tilted our city council. So we actually just passed, um, let's see if I can remember the details, wiping out minimum required parking completely on all projects. And 
and we actually have maximum parking allowed for any projects within a quarter mile of major transit. So, wow. um, and, and I think there are other places, there are definitely lots of people. And I think this actually speaks to um, John's comment earlier around like um, Joe Minicosi and Chuck Marone and, you know, Donald Shoup is another one, the parking, like this, this group of speakers that are traveling around the country and that are talking about these issues and they're gaining a lot of momentum and, um, and I've noticed a lot of it um, really taking off now around the housing crisis. You know, the housing crisis has reached every city in the United States. And, uh, you know, something, I have a statistic in my, one of my other presentations around, you know, something like over half of our seniors are, are retiring with no income, with no savings. And it is now no longer possible to rent an apartment on social security income anywhere in the country. You know, it's just, it's it's everywhere now. It's not just the big cities. And so this housing crisis has really changed the conversation in a lot of places. And then you add the racial justice conversation that's finally, you know, getting going in the past um, nine months. And um, I think a lot of the work that the new urbanist community has been doing over the past 20, 30 years is finally like really hitting the mainstream. And we're seeing it talked about and um, and this parking parking reform is absolutely happening and and a lot of places are wiping out parking minimums uh, not a lot but increasing yeah. numbers of places are wiping out prop parking minimums yeah great I think the city of South Bend may have actually recently removed parking requirements from their zoning code if I'm remembering correctly it has, it has. yeah and and the, you know the two the two things that I tell cities is number one, you can't be for missing middle and for high off street parking requirements. You have to pick one or the other. You can't have both. Yeah. Um, and the second one is just the message that we've done such a we've done a, a, such a good job of delivering spaces for cars at the expense of places for people to live. Like just as a sort of a framing message that it's it's just time for us to to step up and address this issue. I do think what I was going to say earlier too is, you know, a, a diagram, you know, pictures worth a thousand words in the communities we work in, we will often just take one site and we'll show what the zoning allows with the current requirements and what the zoning would allow without parking or what the zoning would allow without this change or without that change. And those, those images are really powerful for people to say, you know, look, you can get this beautiful little fourplex if you don't require any parking, right? Or even if you only require one space per unit as opposed to this, you know, awful, you know, you know, these other solutions, like three story single family home instead, right? Like, which would you rather have to provide more housing or for your, your children to be able to live in so they can live near you or, you know, all those other sorts of things and connecting the stories. And I think that's, that storytelling is really important too. And that's where, you know, even telling the story around like, Missing middle housing is to support walkable neighborhoods and to have walkable neighborhoods, you have to have, a, you know, stores and schools to walk to. And for that walking distance to be short enough, you can't be walking past a lot of driveways, right? Like, you know, there's ways to tell these stories and they're getting out there um, in ways that are really connecting with people in their lived lives. Great, thank you. I think we only have time for one more question. I have Chris Wilson and then you, Stephanos. Um, Chris? As, as long as you make time for Stephanos. Uh, you know, first, uh, thanks and congratulations for this innovative work. It's impressive that you're working at so many scales and addressing social justice issues in substantive ways. A lot of people wave their hands around, but you're really doing some great work. My question's a little bit different, and that's about the, the nature of working from uh, historical precedent. Uh, the missing middle types, let's say, are, you know, date from 1900 to 1940, the ones you're working with. Um, and, uh, you know, then they went for 50 years. And so like uh, all the other ways in which new urbanism and smart growth has tried to reach back and, and learn the lessons, you have to revive them in a, in a new situation, you know, different social expectations, different financing. It's a big question, but just could you give a, a, a few examples of which lessons hold true and what kind of adjustments have you had to make? It, that's a, it's a great question. And I think that translation is, is rarely as simple as just copying the historic example. I think the two biggest reasons, number, number one, are building code. Um, once you jump above three units, you jump into the commercial the IBC building code, which has a whole additional layer of, of requirements that a, a design architecture needs to address. And the second is just 
accessibility requirements. Um, and sort of just as a start, right, it's th those in and of itself require you to just get really creative about the translation um, from a historic example to uh, sort of a newly designed example. And, you know, just, just as an example, like the, the Prairie Queen neighborhood, um, like with the fourplex was one of the types we just had to, well, any, anyway, like we had to make sure that the, a certain percentage of the, the, the units on the ground floor um, were either fully accessible and another percentage of that were visitable. So like they needed bigger bathrooms, uh, more space in the kitchens, um, just larger, larger doorways, sort of more turning space and ability to open doors uh, to meet accessibility requirements. Um, and um, I'm trying to think of what other sort of direct impacts um, sort of the translation typically has. I think that you know, just simple things like the building code requirements for sort of the, 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 the ratio of the rise to run on the stairs can have an impact on how much space is needed. The egress, um, fire egress um, sort of has, it plays a really big role. We had to, for our cul-de-sac project, we had to do like five, pages, a five page application of emer emergency and fire response that dealt with fire access and plan, as well as the fire access and the building design, which included sort of a ladders that got the firefighters up to the third floor from the second floor roof. And so um, it's, it's all the, it's sort of not one big thing, but there's a lot of little things that all add up to make it a fairly substantial and technical uh, sort of effort to translate those types into um, into modern construction and building code um, requirements. Great, thank you. So we still have a, a few questions we didn't get to, which I'm always sad about, but it's also the mark of a, a good and successful event with a lot of engagement when we, we can't get to everything. Um, so Stephanos, do you have any final comments or questions? Well, I, want, I really want to thank Dan and, and Karen for being with us tonight. Uh, we all really admire your work and and your ability to take on seemingly intractable issues and getting to the bottom of it. That's deeply admirable. And it has made you leaders in this uh, field of the country to a degree truly, truly admirable. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I want to, I want to uh, finish with one question. And that is that uh, in certain parts of our country, California is one, we're faced with um, unreasonable and intr intractable uh, regulatory propositions like the affordable housing uh, regulations that have just come to bear starting this year that are um, sort of placing quantity over quality and uh, are bypassing uh, typical community political rights and are suggesting that um, that one can can spur um, housing production without caring for sense of place or, or uh, any, any um, consequence that comes out of, uh, of uh, new projects as they're applied onto existing places. Uh, it is almost a, a seeming uh, replay of the horrors of 1930s public housing and what it did to the United States. How do you, how do you respond to that? What, I mean, what is your your, your beginning thoughts about how one deals with a situation like this, which is the exact opposite of, of Memphis or of South Bend, where you, you have neighborhoods that are um, in, 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 in a shape of either being um, diminished in terms of their, of their, of their quality and value uh, or, or stable, but needing to be improved. It's the exact opposite of many of the projects you showed us. You know, so I, I think, go ahead, Karen. I'll start. Thanks, Dan. Um, uh, theme of the of the afternoon of the evening is awareness of the issues. We are very aware of the issues, and um, you know, one of the things we are doing is using our voice. You know, whenever we can figure out to do that to raise that. I think we've we have built um, particularly well both through our zoning work and through our missing middle housing work. Um, people, a lot of the people who are are working for housing change and zoning reform are aware. Uh, at least somewhat aware of our work. And so when we can, we find the opportunity to have nuanced conversations with them about concerns. Um, and, you know, we're, we're particularly aware right now of the statewide legislation. I think there is real, 
in some ways, real need for the statewide legislation um, addressing zoning reform in 30,000 municipalities across the United States is going to take too long. And we need this housing crisis is is uh, needs attention now. So I think there's some benefits to the statewide reform. And I hear your concerns. And I think it both speaks to, you know, you mentioned, you know, communities, political rights um, to be informed and to be part of the process. And yet other communities have used those rights to prevent housing from being built and prevent housing from being built in their neighborhood for people that they don't want. And so being aware of those, you know, that that dichotomy and and find, I think we're really actively right now trying to find ways into the political process to be able to bring some nuanced design concern into that conversation. Um, the reality is like even here in Berkeley when they're talking about uh, they're talking about eliminating single family zoning. And our concern is if you just eliminate single family zoning, you're going to end up with a lot of lots with four detached single family homes on them. Um, and so bringing up the nuance of you, you need to back that up with the zoning code that um, that involves the community in writing zoning code. And this is one of the real benefits of form-based codes, as you know, that involves the community in writing the, the zoning code and defining a vision and a vision of form and scale as a community that the zoning code then, um, then puts into policy and requires so that then the community is getting their voice in the vision and then writing the, and then writing the zoning code. But then when the development comes, the development can happen quickly. The, the builders can get things done. It's not being used as a discretionary process. It's not being used to hold back. And to me, the benefit of that process is that the conversations are being had at um, at a very high level around where we can balance people's needs. We can balance people's needs for homes and for affordable homes with people's needs for a livable community. And you can't do that if you're doing that on a project by project basis. And you can't do that, you know, if it's just every time a project's reviewed, there's a community response to that. You have to talk about it beforehand. So one of the projects we're working on right now, we're actually starting to focus on the countywide scale. So Memphis is actually a city county we did a, a zoning code for Beaufort County. And right now we're actually, we just uh, drafted one for um, Marin County here in the Bay Area, where what we've done is worked with all of the municipalities within the, the county and all of the cities and towns within the county to create a zoning code template with all of the zones that could apply, uh, that they would need to apply to the entire county. And then each municipality is taking that template and uh, and will then customize the code, pull the, the zones that are applicable to their town and adopt it within their own political jurisdiction. And what that's enabled is this conversation with at the planning director level with all of the planning directors of that town to say, what are the issues and how do you balance these issues? And then to talk at that level within the entire county around these issues. They have homeless issues, they have housing affordability issues, they have segregation issues. And to talk with it without talking about, oh, I'm talking about the lot that's two doors down for me, or I'm talking about, right? So it kind of separates it out a little bit so that people can have more sane conversations. Um, so, you know, I think all of the issues we raise are really important ones and, and challenging ones that um, we are uh, trying to find ways to, to weigh in on and to bring design and, and our knowledge of history, our knowledge of urban renewal, our knowledge of public housing and the, and the, the horrific, you know, that we're having to live with that um, to kind of bring a little bit of um, that historical perspective to those conversations. Can I just say a couple of things as well as I, I always sort of start a response to a question like that by saying, I think we would all agree that places like California need some really dramatic change um, to address the housing issues that we're having. The, the problem is, is that many of the efforts or a majority of them are really pulling the wrong strings to try to get an end result and and are not focused on sort of the quality as well as quantity. And I think just simple things like how existing conditions, a simple thing like lot size that you and I know, Stephanos really impacts the what the outcomes will be of sort of cranking up density or adding a density bonus. They don't understand any of those sort of implications of what those exist, how those existing conditions will impact outcomes um, that they're that they're pr promoting. And so as, as Karen mentioned, we've we've attempted to plug into these conversations, but unfortunately, they're they just move at such a, a train wreck speed that it's really hard to 
not only plug into it, but also uh, inform it because it's moving so fast. But um, you know, but I, I think there, right? There's a group of uh, even in the office earlier today, we had a conversation about the California's density bonus and how we're how we're how we're treating it and treating it differently than other planners are to just ensure predictable results. And I know Vinayak from your office is exploring that same topic because I know he reached out to us a few weeks ago. So that's a really, I think it's a really important topic that probably we as urbanists and new urbanists need to sort of get out of the forefront and sort of try to sort of provide some guidance and direction on because I think it is really important. And I think in the meantime, you know, if if the local jurisdictions, um, you know, start start making some good changes. I think that's a start, but I think it, it needs to sort of be more broadly, the change needs to be more broad than that to really have an impact. I, I, I wanna add one other thing too. I think we're also getting thoughtful or we have been trying to be thoughtful of, around the way the act, activism communities work. And you know, I, the, the, the issues that we're hearing and that they're talking about are so important. Um, and the way that information spreads these days through social media, um, it's a really fascinating time to be involved in that. Um, and even I'll give you an example, even here in California, the, the California YIMBY movement is very strong. And for those of you that are not in California, the Yes in My Backyard group, the YIMBY groups have been behind a lot of the state legislation that's happening and a lot of what's um that of what's moving in in some in some very good ways and and mostly very good ways and in some ways that are that are concerning um and so we've tried to stay um in contact with you know some in those groups or we've been aware of what they're working on and kind of thoughtful but i also noticed an opening the other day because they invited sarah bronin in as one of their guest speakers and sarah bronin is the founder of a group called desegregate connecticut um, and if you haven't seen their website, please go visit it, uh, desegregatect.org. Um, and sh she founded the organization just last June. And since then, they have already put together an amazing coalition of partners across the entire state that are behind their platform. And their platform is, as far as I can tell, a pretty new urbanist platform. It's, you know, model changing the zoning codes, housing, missing, like essentially missing middle housing behind main streets, um, mixed housing. Um, removing parking regulations, a lot of the things that we've been talking about. So they invited, Sarah framed these issues around segregation and desegregating the state and built this coalition. And the California YIMBY group invited Sarah in from cross country over Zoom to speak. And here in California, there's a lot of backlash against form-based codes. The planners here in California, for the most part, are not fans of form-based codes. And we have to be very careful about when we even say the words form-based codes in our work. And we often don't here in California. Um, we will be doing that kind of work, but we won't call it that because of the, of, of the misunderstandings. Um, but there's this huge opening because the California YIMBY founder invited in Sarah Bronin to speak. And Sarah Bronin is a huge advocate of form-based codes. And the first question from the audience is, do you believe in form-based zoning and have you used it? And she's like, yes, absolutely. We love it. It's part of our platform. So I identified that as an opening point to reach out to California NIMBY and say, we need to talk about this. We need, because now they're hearing it from other sources and this is an issue. So, and this is not typical urban designers. Like, like we don't, this is, this kind of activism is not where we historically have sat in, in this world of social change, but we're increasingly, we're finding it necessary that we have to be tied into these activism groups and to the, politicians because they are getting involved and and they don't necessarily have the technical knowledge behind them um, that we would like them to have I guess and so we're we're actively looking for those connections and aware of them and trying to figure out how to impact them um, which is definitely a work in progress I would say well thank you again very very much uh, for for your work and for your presence tonight. And we hope to admire your work uh, in the future for a long, long time to come. Stay in touch. Thank you so much Good for having well. us. Bye-bye.